Well, good morning again and praise the Lord. I uh, haven't sung that song in a long time. That was a beautiful song. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that, reminding us of the wonderful comfort that we have, that no matter what is going on in our lives, that we have a God who cares about us, and He is with us through all the storms in life, and it is well with my soul, and we can trust the Lord. We are uh, working our way through Jonah, and we're in Jonah chapter 3, and I've entitled today's message, The God of Second Chances, and I think it's a fitting title. We will not get through the whole chapter this morning. I'm going to read the whole chapter because I like it. But we're only going to look at the first four verses and talk about the God of second chances this morning. And so if you have your copy of the Bible, turn to Jonah chapter 3. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's one there in the pew. Page 526 should be the proper page to turn to. Let me read this and then ask the Lord's mercy upon us to help us to have a wonderful time in the hearing and the teaching of God's Word. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. And so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covering himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let, but let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? And God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Pray with me. Lord, we are at your mercy. We need ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand the truth of thy word. Lord God, we pray against distractions. We pray against anything that would hinder your truth from going out and ministering to us and reaching everyone where they're at. We pray, God, that you will reveal to us who you are this morning, that you are the God of second chances. And oh, how we need a second and third and fourth and many chances. But we are weak. We are broken, and we are in great need of your mercy. And we're thankful that you pity those who fear you. And you're a father who pities his children, and you are abounding in mercy. You are a good God, a good father, and we're so thankful for that. And so, God, we come to you this morning asking you to minister to each one of us and to have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Well, nobody likes to be the bearer 
of bad news. Nobody likes to do that. If you're the boss or if you work for a boss and that's your position, your job is to be the bearer of bad news and at certain times and certain places you have to go to certain individuals and you have to communicate to them, your time is up, buddy. It's time to go. Sorry. You're the bearer of bad news. It comes with the territory that you have to be that individual that communicates it to whoever you have to communicate it to. Well, equally, we don't like to be the bearer of bad news when it comes to the gospel. You see, the gospel has a, a bad news component to it, right? Uh, the gospel means good news. It is the good news that Christ died for our sins. But there is a side to the gospel that we don't like to talk about. Oh, we don't mind talking about God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our life and that uh, God wants to have a relationship with us, that's pretty much easy to understand and pretty much a joy to talk about. But there's a bad side of the gospel that unless people understand that side of the gospel, they will never come to understand the reason to even believe the good news of the gospel. Every person needs that reason needs to understand why they need the good news of the gospel. And in order for them to understand that, they need to hear the bad news. The bad news is that if you don't turn from your sins, if you don't turn to God in repentance, you will be doomed for all eternity. That is the message. That is the bad news. And this is shocking. Nobody likes to talk about it. But we would not be true to God's word and to the truth of the gospel if we don't communicate that to people. If we don't tell people the bad news that there is a judgment to come, a judgment that they can never really truly stand in, that they will be doomed for all eternity because they've sinned against a holy God. If we don't communicate that to people, they will never ever truly understand their need for the good news of the gospel. There is no salvation for anybody without the bad news. And that is the predicament that Jonah finds himself in. He has to be the bearer of bad news to the Ninevites, so that they can have a chance of hearing some really, 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 really good news. Yet in 40 days, judgment is coming to Nineveh. Believe it or not, there's some good news in that message. It's not tomorrow judgment's coming. You've got 40 days to get your house in line. You've got 40 days to prepare yourself for judgment that is to come. That's mercy. They don't even deserve that. Well, we too have a message to share with the world. It's called the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. It is good news that someone actually went to the cross of Calvary and took the punishment that you and I deserve. But in order for a person to receive that, to understand that good news, they first must see themselves as a sinner was already condemned and will be facing the wrath of God on Judgment Day. And that is hard. That is a hard message to share. In fact, I would say that's probably one of the reasons why most of us keep our mouth closed. We keep our mouth closed. We don't share the gospel because we don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Oh, church of God. We must, we must rise up and we must love people enough to tell them the truth that unless they turn from their sin and believe that Christ died for them, they will perish for all eternity. You see, that is bad news that actually leads to good news because it gives time for people to repent. 
We are here. When Christ died for our sins and you and I put our trust in him, he did not take us immediately to heaven. And he did that for a reason. Because he is long-suffering. He's not willing that any perish. And so he's left us here on planet Earth to be the bearer of bad news so that people would know and, and, re and receive and accept the message of the gospel, which is good news, that Christ can forgive them of all their sins, that he is a God of second chances. And that is what we must do. And so as we come to our text this morning, we are looking at Jonah again. This is the fourth message from Jonah. So far, we've seen that Jonah is a prophet of God who's been given a mission. And in fact, Jonah has been given a mission like no other prophet of Israel, if you think about this. Most prophets of Israel were told to prophesy in Israel to the people of God. They never left Israel or Judah, wherever they were, and they would prophesy to the people of God that judgment was sure to come, turn from your idols, and trust in Yahweh. That was what most prophets did. But Jonah is the first prophet that I know of, that I understand of, that's told to go outside of Israel and go to Nineveh and preach to these people the message. To preach to a people who are the enemies of God, brutal, destructive people, a city filled with violence. Jonah's probably fearful. But Jonah also has a, a certain attitude toward the Ninevites that's causing him not want, not, to not want to obey the Lord. We see that in chapter 4. Oh, God, I knew, I knew that you were a merciful and, and graceful God, slow to anger and not willing to let people perish. And that is why he didn't want to go to the Ninevites. Jonah was a racist. And he did not want to let the Ninevites receive the truth. And so Jonah is a missionary, not a good one. But he's called to go outside of Nineveh. We do have some mercy on him because of the task that is before him. But Jonah disagrees with the Lord. He disagrees with God. And that's fine. Sometimes I can, we, can, I, we all can disagree with God at points, right? But Jonah goes a step further, and he rebels against the Lord, and he actually tries to run from the Lord. He takes a ship that is heading to Tarshish, which will be heading 2,000 miles in the opposite direction of where the Lord wanted him to go. But you know, our God is a God of second chances, and he pursues Jonah in his grace and in his mercy, just like he pursues you and I when we rebel against him. He pursues Jonah. He sends a storm. Jonah's in the bottom of the ship, not even caring and thinking about what was going on. He just wanted to get away from the presence of the Lord. And there's a big storm. Everybody is ready to die. Everyone's ready to perish. Jonah doesn't care. The captain comes to Jonah and wakes him up. And he wakes up and tells him to come upstairs and join the fun. So Jonah goes upstairs and they, they're casting lots. They're having a party of casting lots to find out who's at fault. And we know the story. The lot falls on Jonah. It's Jonah's fault. It's because he's running from God. And the sailors say they're, now they're fearful when they find out who he is and what are we going to do? And Jonah says, throw me overboard. They're even more fearful and they say, we can't do that. And so they begin to try to get back to land. And the Lord wouldn't let them. They were fighting against God. That is a bad place to be when you're fighting against God. Many have tried and all have failed. God always wins. And so they threw him overboard. The sailors cry out to the Lord. For the first time, they use Yahweh's name. Their hearts are converted. They're no longer turning to their idols. They're turning to Yahweh, Jehovah. And they, after they throw Jonah off the boat... Jonah now in his despair, he begins to sink to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And his life is about to come to an end. But he doesn't want to die. He does not want to die. And so at that moment, he begins to look up toward 
the holy temple of the Lord. And he cries out in his distress. And the Lord had mercy on him and prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. A miracle took place. And you say, ah, I don't believe that could have happened. Three days and three nights. Our God is a God of miracles. God spoke the world into existence. Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. And he uses that story as a truthful thing that took place. And if you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, you ought to believe that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days, just like God's word says it was. And so, as we come to our story where we're at now in chapter 3, Jonah was rescued by the Lord. It says in verse 10 of chapter 2, So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. God spoke to the fish. The fish listened to, jo to, to the Lord. Just like the Lord spoke the world into existence with his power, fish belongs to God. He created it. He spoke to the fish. The fish puked Jonah up onto dry land. We don't know exactly where Jonah was placed, but I would say wherever the Lord threw him up, whatever that fish threw him up at, it was probably close to Nineveh. Probably close to Nineveh. Because I believe that word got back to the Ninevites. You got to hear this story of this guy. You got to see what he looks like, right? He's been in the belly of a fish for three days, three nights. You got to hear what he's saying. Got to hear what he's saying. And so, words traveling. And so, today's message is a simple one it is that God is a God of second chances. He is a merciful God, one who is slow to anger. He, he does not give us what we deserve. And God is looking to use every one of us individually and corporately. He is, use, he is looking to use us. That's all today's message is all about. And so chapter 3 really begins a little bit like chapter 1. Let me read it. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. I want to focus on a phrase from that verse, those verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. When God's word comes to us, it is a blessing it is a privilege for anyone to hear the words of the Lord. God is being merciful to Jonah. God has not given Jonah what he deserves. He is allowing the word of God to come to him. And I want all of us this morning to realize that none of us deserves to hear the word of the Lord. It is a privilege it is a blessing. It is a gift from God. Jesus would often say this when he was teaching the parables. He would say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Now you look on your head. We all have ears, right? And so what is he talking about? It is an unbelievable gift to hear the words of the Lord. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. It is a blessing and a privilege. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 through 17, the words of Jesus says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear, but catch it, they did not hear it. God chose at a certain point in history to reveal who Jesus was to a certain generation and many prophets and righteous people were longing to know when the Messiah was. They wanted to see that. They wanted to hear the words of Jesus. You and I have our Bibles. Some of them have the words of Jesus printed in red. Right? We're so blessed as a people 
blessed. Many have longed to hear the words of God. And I want you to also hear these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. God's primary method of communicating truth to his people is through words. Words. That's what God has chosen to use to communicate to you and me. He's, com- he's chosen to communicate words. God speaks to us through words. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And as I was thinking about this, I said, Lord, help us to see this, that we need to be good, hear- good listeners, good, good hearers, and listen to what God is trying to communicate to us. But in order for us to do that, we need to prepare ourselves and our hearts and our minds to hear the word of the Lord. I often wonder how many times is God trying to talk to me and speak to you? and How many times I'm not hearing him? I'm trying to get a message from creation. Okay. Trying to get a message from a song. Okay. Primary method that God has chosen to communicate to you and me is his words. I wonder how many times he's trying to reach out to us, but we're not hearing him. And that is why Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, I think it's verse 16, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. How can we take heed how we hear? The word of the Lord came to Jonah. I want the word to come to me. I I know you want the word to come to you. But God's word says you need to take heed how you hear. There's preparations. There's an attitude that needs to take place in people's lives in order for them to hear what God's trying to say. And we got so many distractions in our life today. So many. There's an attitude. There's an attention. There's Prayer, our hearts need to be prepared. My attitude ought to be, I I need to hear from you, God. I want to hear from you. I need you. Our hearts and our minds ought to be, as the psalmist would often say, as well as the prophet Isaiah, that we are trembling at the word of the Lord. That's a person who sees their need to hear God's word. And I cannot stress this enough, especially to our young people. We are a lost generation. We are truly, truly a lost generation. Because I got one, and I know everyone's got one. Our gadgets are the cause of so much robbed time that are, that are causing us not to hear God's voice. And even if you put it down, you've already been trained how to receive words, how to receive information. And the church of God is totally plagued by this because we're just like the world. We're looking at our screen, whether it be on a big screen or a little screen, and it's coming to us how? Quickly. So fast. Right? And we get used to looking at things fast. And if that thing doesn't go fast enough, what do we do? Oh, I need to get a new one. I need to update. Right? Because we're so used to things coming fast. But listen, God's not going to change the way he gives truth to us. Right? We're we're a younger generation today. We don't use the hymns. Okay, big deal. We got a screen. We use that. And some of the older folks, oh, we want to get back to the hymns. And you know what I'm saying? Because we want to slow down and read the words. It's important. Slow down and read the words. It's hard to do that. It's hard. I think I've lost a few young people already. They don't even listen to me anymore. We need to slow down. Slow our minds down and just pause. I need to hear from you, God. And so when I was reading this text, I was saying, 
Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. I'm like, wow, the Spirit of God convicted me because I can be guilty of, of wanting to receive things so quickly. I wonder how many times God is trying to get a hold of me. And I don't hear him. Many of us, both young and old, I believe, are spiritually anemic. We're starving spiritually. Many of us here have known the Lord in not just this church, but all over every church. We've known the Lord for a long time. We've known the Lord for many years, but we don't really know him. Because we don't spend time with him. We don't listen to what he's trying to say to us. We don't hear his voice. And God has chosen. I mean, he can speak to us in many ways because if he wants his will to be carried out, he's going to bring that across on your screen so you can get it, right? He is sovereign. So lest I, you know, make us all revert and throw these things away and just all go back to our printed version here, God can do whatever he's got to do, but how many of us are missing out? How many of us are missing out because he's trying to speak to us? Reveal to us. He's chosen to reveal and to communicate to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit living in us, but the Spirit uses the word that is in us. And so as we come to Jonah 3, it's all about God speaking to one man, Jonah. And he obeyed the Lord. A great revival took place in the most wicked country at that time, Nineveh. How did it come there? Listen, because of the word of God. Not, nothing special about Jonah. He might have looked crazy. It was because the word of the Lord. And so God can revive you. He can bring life to you and grace to your life through his word. Are you getting it this morning? Just nod your heads and we'll get done and move on to something else. Amen? And so I hope we all see that the hearing of the word of God is so important. God wants to speak to you. And so the question is, are you willing to slow down so that you can hear him? Notice what the text says. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, what? A second time. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God is a God of mercy and that he came to Jonah a second time and he will come to you and he will come to me a second and third and fourth time? God is a God of mercy. You see, the first time that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, that was a gift. Right? The second time that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, that was just sheer mercy. That was God's mercy. I want you to hear this. Our God is a merciful God. He is a God who gives second chances to those who obey him and follow him. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that our God is a God who does not give us what we deserve, but he is a merciful, compassionate God? Psalm 103 Verses 8 through 14 says this, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. It's abounding. No, I don't think anywhere in the Bible does it say that God's wrath is abounding. But it does say His mercy is abounding. Amen? It says, He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who what? Fear him. For as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who what? Fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Wow, that ought to become your favorite psalm. It's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Now, we understand that the Lord had every right to be angry with Jonah. 
for Jonah's not obeying him. Jonah had not, had not listened to him. So he had every right to be angry with Jonah and to actually discard him. To say, I'm no longer going to use you, Jonah. You are no longer my servant, no longer my prophet. I'm going to put you on the shelf of shame or the shelf of uselessness. Never going to use you again. God have every right to do that. I'm so glad that that's not the way our God operates. And I think you are too. Our God is not a God who does those kinds of things. He doesn't discard us. He doesn't put us to the side. God shows his mercy to Jonah. He commands him again to be his missionary because Jonah is has been chosen by the Lord to be his vessel to bring mercy to the Ninevites. And God uses people like Jonah to communicate his word, his words to, to a lost and broken world. He uses broken people to reach broken and lost people. And if you think about it, the message that we're sharing is our God is a God of second chances. We're taking we who are people who have received God's mercy that we've received, that we are taking a message that we've received, that God is a God of second chances, and we're bringing that to people who need to hear that our God is a God of second chances. Amen? Our God is a God of second chances. And that's the message that we bring to the world. Consider the mercy of the Lord, will you? Consider it. He, did, uh, he took a person that rebelled against him, Jonah, and did not discard him. Just like, think of this throughout history. He took a man by the name of Peter who denied the Lord three times and yet the Lord restored him and used him to communicate his truth. He took a man by the name of Abraham who kept on lying about who he was and who Sarah was, but yet the Lord took Abraham and made him a father of many nations. And then we have the story of Jacob, who wrestled against the Lord and did not want to obey him. But yet the Lord took this man, this broken man, and made him Israel. From all the tribes of Israel come from this man, Jacob. And then we look at the man, Moses, who was a murderer. He killed an Egyptian. He looked everywhere. Nobody was looking. He thought he got scot-free, and he killed an Egyptian. And the Lord took Moses and showed him his glory. And not only that, used Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt and to produce the law of God that you and I have today. And it goes on and on. We can think of Saul, who was trying to wipe out the church. And God intervened in his life and changed him from, from Saul to Paul, and God gave him mercy And so if God can use a disobedient and reluctant servant like Jonah, he can use you. He can use me. I want you to understand something else this morning. God can use one person. Jonah is only one person that God used in this story that we're learning about. One person. And God used him to radically change a country called Nineveh. One person, one individual, one person who submits to him. God can do great things through one vessel that says, Here I am, Lord, use me. One person, one individual. And all God is looking for is a willing heart to submit to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. My life is like a blank piece of paper. You write on it what you want put on it, and I will follow it, Lord. I am here. I surrender to you. I've tried my way. Many of us have tried our way, and it didn't work. It didn't work. And now I come to you, Lord. Here I am. I am willing to go. I am willing to be. I am willing to do whatever you call me to do. I want to be that one person. The question I ask for you this morning to prayerfully consider is would you be that one person? Don't look around you. 
Don't think about somebody else. Don't think about your problems. Be the one person that God wants you to be. Don't wait for anybody else. Be the one person that God wants you to be. Be the one. Don't wait for anybody else. And so the Bible says in verses 3 and 4 that Jonah arose. Notice that. And he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. That's, saying, that's not saying how far or how long it took him to get there. That's saying how the, the area of Nineveh would take him three days in extent for him to communicate the gospel in different places. And I read that historians have actually validated that measurement there. And so verse 4, Jonah began to enter the city on the first walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I want you to notice Jonah's response this morning. It's not like the same response he had before, right? He arose, but then he went to Nineveh. This time he arose, and he went to exactly where the Lord told him to go. This is not shocking. This should not shock us at all, because this is the mark of somebody who is now walking with the Lord. He arose and he went to where he was supposed to go in response to the Lord. You and I only need to hear the word of the Lord coming to us a second and third and fourth time when we're holding on to sin, living in sin. Or we have idols in our heart that we don't want to get rid of and so we don't listen to the Lord. You see, obedience, obedience is always a sign of a heart that is right with the Lord. Jonah might not totally agree with the mission that the Lord has given to him, but he's no longer fighting against God. He fears the Lord. I also want to point out to you that Jonah's obedience is not perfect. Neither will your obedience. Neither will my be. My and your obedience will never be perfect in this day and age. But the mark of a person who wants to walk with the Lord is obedience. It's obedience. His message is simple. Yet in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overturned. Jonah has a hard message to give to the people of Nineveh, but this is the message that he's been commanded to preach. And notice that Jonah doesn't change it. He says, this is really hard, God. You know what? This is a hard message, God. He didn't dilute it, didn't change it in any way whatsoever. He said exactly. In fact, the Lord didn't even tell him what he was going to say until later on. I'll tell you later, he says in verse 2, Arise and go to that great city and preach to it the message that I'll tell you. I'll tell you later. Jonah found out what the message was. Didn't change it at all. It's tempting to soften the word of God. It's tempting to soften the word of God and focus on mercy instead of judgment. But Jonah obeys and gives the message that he was told to give. Today, you and I also have a simple message. It's simple, but it's hard. God is calling us to obey. And if you think through the gospel message, it's not an easy task that we have before us. And I know the Lord understands that. Think of the the words, the statement alone. Jesus is the only way. Very inclusive, is it not? Jesus is the only way. And that's what God wants us to communicate to this world around us. This world that basically looks at that there are many ways to get to God. And so they're going to mock. They're going to ridicule us. They're going to make fun of us. They're not going to want to believe the message because... It's inclusive. But how do we know Jesus is the only way? How do we know Jesus is the only way? Well, Jesus is the only one who went to the cross of Calvary and died for our sins. He's the only one who took the punishment that you and I deserve. Jesus is the only one who defeated death. He rose again from the dead. He's alive today. He's the only one. Jesus is the only one who actually said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one. There's no other way. You and I must communicate what God has told us. And it's not going to be easy. But see, not all people are going to mock. Not all people are going to reject the message that we have for them. 
some will believe. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is preaching to the philosophers at Athens, and he's calling them to repent, to turn from their false gods and put their trust in the one true God. Acts 17, verses 30 and follow when it says this, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. Listen, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance to this to all by rising him, raising him excuse me, from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among, the, among them, catch verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed. So they mocked. Paul gave the truth. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't change it. Got to the resurrection. Whoa. No, no way. I'm not going to believe this. This is a deal breaker. Some mocked. Some said, we'll listen to you later on this matter. Some actually believed and followed Paul. That's what's going to happen today. You will have people who will reject you. You will have people who, ha who will mock you. But the Lord has those whom he has prepared to hear the message that God wants the church, every one of us, to be a Jonah and obey the Lord and communicate to be the bearer of bad news. God has chosen us, each individual person. And in His mercy, God has given time for people to repent. But those days of that time is coming to an end. The Scripture says He's appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has appointed. And it is appointed that a man to die once, and that day will be judgment. It's coming. Judgment is coming. It's bad news. Yet in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. God in His mercy has given people time to repent, time to turn. That means He's given you and I time. He's given us time to get our life in order, to be that one like Jonah, to say, okay, Lord, here I am. My life is a blank piece of paper. Take my life and use me. I want to be obedient to you. Because God in His mercy does not want to give the world what they deserve, just like He didn't want to give you and I what we deserve. He's giving us time. Brothers and sisters, look around us. Things are getting worse. Things are getting worse. Time is running out. We need to sense the urgency and get busy for God, the God of second chances. He is a God of second chances, and he's looking for that one person. Could be you this morning, who says, I'm willing, God. I'm surrendering to you. Whatever your will is, here I am. Take my life and use me. I want to be obedient to you. The Lord is looking for that one person who completely surrenders to him. And guess what God would do the moment you surrender to him? He will show himself strong to you. He will show himself strong to you. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Listen, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. That's you. That's me. God wants to show himself strong to you as our hearts are loyal to him. So if we want to see revival, if we want to see people turn to the Lord, if we want to see our, our neighbors change, our church change, our teenagers change, we must be the ones that lead the way and say, here I am, Lord, use me. And I pray Today is the day for all of us to say, okay, I've resisted long enough. Today, I surrender to you, Lord. Take my life. Use me. Father, I pray that you and your mercy would work in all of our hearts. We would be obedient to 
to the truth of your word, that we would submit to you in every area of our life, that we would be Jonah. As the word of the Lord comes to us, we would see it as a precious gift. We would tremble at it. We would receive it. And we will be obedient to it. And we will go where you tell us to go. We will do what you tell us to do. We will be the person you want us to be. Oh, God, may you revive us, revive us, revive us again. And this I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why don't we all rise from where we're sitting and in a prayerful attention to the, to the song we're about to sing. If God has spoken to you today, if you desire to take that step and say, I want to be used by the Lord, if you want counsel, if you want to talk to someone, slide out of your pew and we can talk to you. We can get you the help you need. But right where you're sitting this morning, make that decision. Say, I want to go. I want to be what the Lord wants me to be. Let's sing unto the Lord. The grave. 